Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Be Prepared, the GNCRT Guide to Addressing Comic Book Bans, Censorship, and Challenges. I'm Robin Brenner, and I'm the teen librarian at the Public Library of Brookline in Massachusetts, and I'll be moderating today's program. I wanted to go ahead and go through a few technical details for everybody first. So before we begin, uh, we can talk that through. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. The Booklist team will do their best to respond to all the tech-related questions and will pass along all the other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Links to the GNCRT Challenge Toolkit and Challenge Survey were included in the, in the reminder email that you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links that are located there. If you have any trouble accessing these materials, please send Booklist a message in the Q&A or contact them at webinars at booklistonline.com. Finally, Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click on the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned earlier. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. And now we're gonna get started. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce our panelists for today. Um, first, we have Amy Wright, who is a past president of ALA's Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable and currently chairs the Addressing Comic Book Bans and Challenges Committee. Then we have Julia Lanter, who is the assistant director at the Exeter Public Library in Exeter, New Hampshire. Next is Gabriel Lopez, uh, acquisitions technician at the Sultan Puss Library at Our Lady of the Lake University. And finally, Ryan Grant, who's a teacher librarian for Michael Anderson Elementary School at Fairchild Air Force Base outside of Spokane, Washington. So we decided to go ahead and just go with those introductions for now. Everyone will be talking about their roles in the committee. And first, we're going to move on to Amy talking about the brief history of comic censorship in libraries. Yeah, so in five minutes or less, I'm going to talk about um, all that's come before. So I think maybe something that many of us maybe don't know or maybe don't know enough about is that the current moment we're in has also happened before. Um, you may or may not know about the comic book hysteria of 1954. So this is Dr. Frederick Gortham, who published Seduction of the Innocent and very famously gave bombastic testimony during um, the US Senate subcommittee hearings on juvenile delinquency in comic books in 1954. That is an actual quote from the proceedings. Um, if you have a chance, I would urge you to go back and look over some of the testimony. Um, long story short, a lot of the uh, proponents against comic books find that the reading of comic books um, by youth especially, so very much like we're seeing today, a very a concern around child reading, um, that comic books would lead to juvenile delinquency, um, would lead to sexual depravity, and basically completely scuttle the nation. Um, what you may not know is that the US was not alone in this. Um, there were Senate hearings about comic books in Canada as well. And Canada actually had added comic books to the criminal code starting in 1949. And Clan Comics was actually part of the Canadian criminal code for obscenity until 2018. Similar hearings took place also in the UK, um, specifically focused around horror comics, but a lot of the things were very much grouped under the umbrella of all comic books were deemed horror comics or crime comics. What you may not know about is that while all these were going on and there was a lot of scrutiny over particular central figures like Wortham, there was a huge groundswell of community support for these initiatives, especially from teachers and librarians and other what we would call citizen action groups. So civilian groups, um, citizen groups that were very concerned about child reading. Um, in Canada, one of the groups that I've been researching, um, I'm actually former librarian, current PhD student, 
And this is a group I've been researching in Alberta. They're called the Alberta Board and Objectionable Materials. Um, this is actually a shot from the Calgary Public Library in 1955. And they were a group active for more than 20 years across Canada. We have similar groups though in the US. Uh, there is the National Organization for Decent Literature. We also have the um, Crime Comics Committee in British Columbia, which was part of the British Columbia Parent Teacher Association. Um, in the UK, one of the main instigators behind the movement against horror comics was actually the National Union of Teachers. So I think something that's untalked about um, and definitely is something that we're seeing today with a lot of the well-organized groundswell movement is that all of these movements may have had particular figures that are known and maybe remembered by history, but there's a lot of community support for these initiatives. And unfortunately, a lot of it came within um, the library profession and within educational circles. So the history of comic book censorship is far longer um, than a lot of us realize and actually had very well established um, transnational networks of support for far longer than we realize. Which leads us to today's current moment. We can go to the next slide. So this is why part of the organization came about is that we realized um, we can do more to actually be better advocates um, for the format we all know and love. We can be better advocates for our profession to actually take a stand against this. So in addition to being a school librarian this year, uh, Ryan Grant, um, I'm also the chair of the school library division for the Washington Library Association. So you would suppose that Washington being a fairly progressive state, we wouldn't have some of these issues, but we've had book challenges um, all through the state, liberal areas, conservative areas. Um, it, it's everywhere right now. And part of what we developed through the toolkit that we wanted to share with everybody today is a checklist of what to do before, what to do during, what to do after a challenge um, based off some of the experiences that we've had here in Washington State. A couple of areas that I'd highlight in the before section. Um, at this point, we'd really like everybody to just assume that a challenge is coming to you. Um, so if you're in the school library section, what are your policies? What are your school board policies? What are your county policies? Is there a policy in place? Because if there's not, you probably want to go out and find the best practices and get one. Um, for friends in the public library sector, what do your policies say? Um, are they good compared to the ones around you? Um, another area there that we'd really stress is pay attention to what's being challenged around you. A lot of this just gets passed from group to group. Um, a challenge will happen over across the border in Idaho, and we start hearing about that over here in the Spokane area. They're all going off the same list right now in a lot of ways. So if you hear about a book like Jack of Hearts getting challenged over on the west side, it's probably going to get challenged near you too. Um, a funny story out of Idaho is that one of the public library systems there got a list of books that somebody wanted to challenge and none of them were actually in the system. They were just going off a list they took from somebody else. So pay attention to what's going on around you. During a challenge, it's highly stressful. Um, the discourse around teachers and librarians as groomers and trying to hurt children is really freaking disgusting right now. Um, some of the attacks on well-meaning librarians here in Washington State have been beyond the pale disgusting. So during a challenge, please find your community supports. Um, reach out to your state association, reach out to the ALA, get your team together. Don't try to carry that burden on your own because it is, it's pretty awful. Um, but also on the academic side of it, find the reviews for the books. If you're in a a school library setting, how does it work in with your curriculum? Um, have that back up and present it accurately. After a challenge, breathe. Um, the things that I'd really highlight there, um, bullet point number three under after about a cooling off period, you want to make sure that your policies have that so that the same book or the same idea can't be challenged again and again and again and again. And 
also think about the genre that is being challenged um, in conservative parts of Washington state. It's been LGBTQ materials. If they go after one, they're probably gonna go after all of them. Um, if your search for your system allows for keyword search, they're just typing in whatever their hot button is and printing off the entire list. So when you have a challenge on one book from a genre, like graphic novels, you can think about how could that affect the other books on the shelf that are like that. So we hope that the checklist is helpful to you and I'll give it to the next slide. Part of the committee's challenge was to collect information specifically on graphic novels and what was going on right now throughout um, the nation. And what we first did was put out a survey, which is still open. We're still collecting information. So please, um, if you haven't responded, please do. Um, for our results so far, um, our first question we asked was, do you have a challenge policy at your library? And unfortunately, 58% of the respondents said no. And uh, if you were listening to Ryan about our checklist, I think he said the word policy about nine or 10 times. So policy and procedure are where you want to start. If you're just overwhelmed and not clear on where to begin, begin with your policy. Um, the American Library Association Office of Intellectual Freedom has a selection and reconsideration policy toolkit. Um, they're for public libraries, academic, and school libraries. So if you feel overwhelmed, start there. Um, it's a great way to develop your plan because you will need a policy and a plan going ahead. And next slide. Uh, thank you, Julia. We asked participants what resources, tools, or community supports would be most helpful for preparing for and addressing comics challenges. Looking at the results of our survey, you can see the form of training library staff would find most helpful are samples of talking points and letters to send in response to challenges. This is incredibly important when considering groups like No Left Turn. They provide members with sample letters, petitions, model legislation, etc. I'm currently an MLIS student at the University of North Texas. I took Dr. Sarah Evans graphic novels class and one of our assignments was writing a sample letter to a challenge. I found this incredibly helpful. Libraries could consider including similar exercises during onboarding training or as regular training practice for frontline staff. In Texas, the organization Freedom Fighters is leading the charge against library challenges. They offer resources and responses to FAQs and sample letters as well. The next resource considered most helpful are samples of collection development policies. One tip is to look for other libraries in your area or similarly sized institutions across the country and look at their policies. Many libraries post their collection development policies online, and if not, I'm sure they would be happy to share and discuss their policies with other librarians. Another tip would be to keep an eye out for stories about positive outcomes against challenges. If the institution is able to keep challenge items, take a look to see what you can view or request. Uh, if you can take a look at and view their collection development policy or request one from them. I work in an academic library and re research collection development policies from similar institutions when we recently revamped ours. While academic libraries may not have faced many challenges up till now, uh, it is best to be prepared. Third most popular are webinars like this panel. Add notifications and alert from organizations like Library Journal to know when webinars, what, Library Journal and Book List to know when webinars may occur. Finally, are lists of recently and historically banned comic books. Organizations like CBLDF have a list of historically challenged comics. Plus there are many lib guides with lists of banned and challenged comics. Uh, I will now pass the mic back to Ryan. Next. Um, in addition to the formal challenges that we're seeing a lot of, we also wanted to say a word about soft censorship. Um, Sometimes that's internal when that comes from you being worried about what the reaction is to putting a book out on the shelf. And a couple of examples that I wanted to share. 
Um, I am Jazz, the story of Jazz Jennings, um, a transgender child. Very good story, very readable, very relatable, and one that's getting challenged all over the place because of the topic being tied into LGBTQ issues. This is when I would talk to you about look at the reviews and think about who your um, who are the constituents in your area. This is a valid book. It really resonates with a certain segment of the population, but I've talked to librarians who are, Ryan, I can't have that in my library. But go to your values, go to your policies. There's that word again. And think about who are you serving? Um, a challenge that happened in North Central Washington that I didn't see coming, the biography of AOC, um, a librarian told me, Ryan, I will get reamed if I put a book about her out on the shelves, but she is a modern figure with a constituency. Um, one of the more aggressively challenged books this year has been Something Happened in Our Town, which is a story about school shootings, um, police shootings rather. Again, that topic is a very hot button topic for a certain segment, but the story stands for itself. The review stands for themselves. Um, if a librarian was afraid to put this out, again, I'd say, who are you appeasing? Why are you saying no to this book? And what are your collection development policies? The last book I'll share for this section from Archie to Zach is a story about two boys who love each other. Um, it's not graphic. It's not, it's a good story. It's a cute story. It's a loving story. Um, but that came up in down in the Yakima area that Ryan, we can't have stories like that. Yes, you can. Um, so this would be the pep talk portion of, if you're a librarian, what are your values? What are the values of your school? What are the values of your system? And don't run away from literature because of the perception. Have a way to make that justification. Um, back to the slide, two of the things that you can see on there are mouse being banned in Tennessee, um, just because of the topic. What happened with a new kid by Jerry Craft down, being banned, literally banned, down in Texas? Um, the administrator in South Lake in Texas who said, Well, if you have one side of the Holocaust on your shelf, you better have the other. She quickly backtracked from that, but come on. Um, what that told a lot, bunch of school, school teachers for their classroom collections was if I can't have one side, then I can't have any side. And, we shouldn't have to be making these decisions. So stick to your values, stick to what matters to you and your system and don't pull books just because have a reason if you do it. So next slide. Yeah, I can just pop in here. So I think one of um, the reasons to, to highlight the historical um, history of comic censorship is to talk about something that we don't talk about enough in librarianship, which is other forms of censorship. We, I would say, are generally familiar with bans and challenges. So of course, challenges, somebody says, I think this book should be removed from the shelf. A ban is when it's actually removed from the shelf. We don't talk about enough though what falls under the umbrella of other forms of censorship and this is very, very large. Um, so that can include um, gatekeeping, self censorship or other form of coercion and restrictive measures. And one of the things that we've heard from the survey participants so far is that there's a lot of preemptive censoring going on or just what Ryan described, a lot of people saying, well, I'm not sure we can have this on the shelf or people making personal judgments. Um, we do have collection development policies in place for a reason. We should have challenge policies in place for a reason as well. And one of the things, especially with something like New Kid, um, well, actually, if we take New Kid, Gender Queer, Mouse, um, for example, like three exceptionally award-winning comic books, not just a few awards, like, New Kid, as we know, is the first graphic novel to win the Newbery. So there's no reason why a book like that should be pulled from the shelf. But one of the reason I wanted to spotlight, um, that is one of my large dogs, <laughs> um, knew they'd make an appearance. I wanted to spotlight New Kid is, if you do look at the list of, um, the OIF list of most banned and challenged titles for this past year, Gender Queer is the number one, but New Kid does not make the list of top 10. So 
What is important to point out for that is PEN America, CBLDF, um, Office of Intellectual Freedom are doing a fantastic job. But as you may have noticed on the slide previously, the Office of Intellectual Freedom estimates that between 85 and 95% of chan, um, bans and challenges go unreported. So that's a huge amount of that sort of other forms of censorship that we're not capturing. And particularly, you can see that Jerry Craft's new kid does not appear on PEN America or OIF's list, even though we know that that was pulled from school reading lists, it was pulled from summer reading lists, it was pulled from um, like a first, first year, first week of school lists where people, all the kids going into grade six to read this book. Um, so we know that this stuff is happening. And that was also, I wanted to sort of draw attention to the historical censorship where I think sometimes we, we have a lot of vocational pride and that's very important, but we also need to have a lot of vocational, I don't know what the word I look, we need to actually look critically at our own profession and that we always haven't been on the correct side of fighting for intellectual freedom for all of our communities. Um, it's a very particular sort of vacuum idea of what intellectual freedom looks like. And it's something that we need to have a reckoning with, with our own profession. And just remember that we have not always been on the right side of these battles. Okay, so I believe we're gonna leave this slide up for a little while, just so everyone can uh, see the links that we have to both the toolkit and the survey. Um, but we're gonna head into our discussion portion of the panel. And um, we or have a number of questions we're gonna ask, but we're also of course seeking questions from all of you through the Q&A. So we will start off. Uh, a few of you have already talked about um, how you've dealt with soft censorship a little bit. Um, I know that's a big concern for a lot of library staff, um, especially in the sense of when you see it within your own institution um, or within your own circles to figure out how best to address it. Um, so I wondered if, if anyone else would like to speak from the committee on their experiences with soft censorship and, and how you've dealt with that if you've had to. We had had a question about soft censorship being just buying books, but also promoting them within the library. Um, an example, uh, I am uh, assistant director at a, a small library in New Hampshire. And in New Hampshire, one of our libraries celebrated in June um, uh, Pride Month and had a display and a trustee took out all the books. Um, so, Part of that is what do we do in these situations where someone from within is, is not allowing us to promote the books. Um, something that our um, uh, Office of Intellectual Freedom for New Hampshire came up with was having images of the books. So even if the books go out or are taken or stolen, you can still promote them and say, get yourself on the reserve list where we're buying these again. Also um, opening up interlibrary loan so that smaller libraries or libraries with less resources or budgets um, can help get the help from the bigger libraries through interlibrary loan programs. So if the excuse is, oh, there's just no money in the budget to buy those types of books, whatever the objection being, um, you can really open that up um, and support each other in our field. Again, going back to what Amy is saying that we need to be realistic and support each other. Um, but yes, there's many different ways of soft censorship, not just buying books, but promoting them and not hiding them. Um, I knew of an older librarian that would hide any books that were um, with the theme of Black Lives Matter in biographies, because, and I quote, no children read biographies. So she would literally hide them. Um, luckily, um, she was discovered, but I think that we all, if we talk to each other in the industry, have one of those stories of, well, there was that one lady that I worked with who dot, dot, dot. And um, I'd like to speak a little bit to the question that Jessica asked about whether we call them banned and challenged books or whether we talk more about the freedom to read. And I think that there's a lot of power in that too, that if we give a label to a book or a genre, then we're kind of opening that those up to scrutiny that they may not deserve and may not get otherwise. So um, 
I would ask folks to really think a lot about how you present those books to your broader community. Um, there may be places where calling them banned books is the right thing to do because that lights a fire. But if you talk to more about the freedom to read, that might be a way in some more conservative communities, especially to really address that. And I don't want any book to ever be perceived where I am anyway, as a banned book, because I'm trying to get most of them back and in circulation. So I'm um, thinking about how we describe those. And just to the soft censorship idea too. Yeah, I've been through that when I'm looking at, you know, my book list for next year. And well, I know that that's going to be a problem, but that's when I talk about policy again. Um, think about how you're going to address that problem when it comes up. Don't run away from a book just because it made the newspapers. Um, what are the merits of the book? What are the reviews of the book? And does it have a place in your collection? Okay. Um, one of the other things, we have a number of questions coming in as well. And I saw, um, there's a discussion of the idea of uh, what kind of resources can you use or should you use when a group threatens to picket or protest or sit in front of your library. And we were all going to discuss a little bit the, the problem that we're all facing very well organized groups at this point, as we've already discussed, um, that there's a lot of coordination and a lot of discussion kind of leading up to specific challenges. Um, so I just wondered if you could all talk about how, the, you know, what are the resources you might consider and how to find partners when you're fighting a challenge? Um, I can start. I think, um, I mean, the biggest thing I would say is, and it's on our checklist, but you are not alone in this. Um, one of the things I think we were also happy is we do have a graphic novel and comics roundtable. Um, as part of the American Library Association, what some of our listeners may not be aware of, we have international colleagues too. So um, the Australian Library Association now has um, a graphic novel group as well. Hello, Ergi and folks. I know they're going to listen in later. Um, so there are more of us than there were before. So A, you're not alone. Number two, as Ryan was saying, going through the checklist, anticipate that you will get a challenge. Um, I think sometimes, again, we are maybe not as proactive as we could be as a profession. Um, we are dealing with our communities and all of the different ebbs and flows of community life and expecting that you will get a challenge is I think the best way to approach this. Knowing that, build your advocates, um, whether that's your library board, whether it's parent teacher association. I think something that got overlooked with a lot of the scrutiny around new kid is that we had some parents coming forth saying that they were speaking on the part of all parents. That's not accurate. Um, if you have a parent come forth saying, this is something I have a problem with, have other parents that you already have as advocates in the community come forth and be those advocates for the title. Um, and I know we'll get more into this, but make sure you do have comprehensive challenge policies in place. Specifically, your challenge policy should ask the following questions. Number one, have you read this book? If the answer is no, that challenge should be dead on arrival. Number two, what exact reason are you giving for this being a challenge? This particular uh, picture on page, yada, yada, this is why I think it's inappropriate. And then the challenge policy should also spell out what will happen, who it will go to, and exactly the life of that challenge policy. No title should be removed while the challenge policy is going through. When that challenge is submitted, you should also have in place all of the policy why this title was appropriate. Again, new kid, gender queer, mouse, there are no reason why any of those titles should have been pulled from the shelf. Based on our own rather conservative collection development policies, those are some of the most award-winning titles of the past 10 to 20 years, period. Um, Maya Kobe was on our panel during ALA, and um, I, I said to Em, I was like, wow, your book is just so award-winning because Genderqueer has won so many different awards. Um, same with New Kid. It has won a spectrum of awards. Same with Mouse. Any collection development policy, we're looking to add 
books that are well regarded, that have good reviews, that fill holes in our collection, that add to our collection. By any accounts, these are the titles that we should have. So the fact that we're going against not only our own challenge policies, but our own collection development policies and making these decisions without following our own policies is a huge problem. So I think just making sure you have a lot of these policies and advocacies in place before. <laughs> so if you're not doing it now, think about doing that. These should be living documents that you as a library are looking at every three to five years. And to the point of the question too about outside groups coming in, we saw that a couple of weeks ago with Proud Boys coming to disrupt story time for children. Um, and that's the kind of scary escalation that I think a lot of us are really worried about. Um, for those of you who are managers or directors especially, make sure that you have the policy in place of how do you handle disruptions. Um, if you get pre-warning that one of these, and I'm going to call them extremist groups, is planning to come to your library, at what point do you notify law enforcement? Um, I would never want to make this completely a political thing, but if you know that one group is going to be um, protesting outside of a board meeting, let's say, do you have a local branch of the ACLU that could step up for freedom of speech? Do you have other groups like that who could hopefully be there so it's not overwhelming numbers on one side? Um, in Kent, over in Washington State, on the other side of the state from me, when it was just one side, when it was just one side doing most of the talking, that was harmful to the librarians over there. When both sides of the issue really started speaking up, that's when the school board could really see the diversity of thought there that they needed to see. So um, on the checklist, I think there was something about knowing who your local stakeholders are, especially if you're hearing about people coming to the library to be disruptive or to protest. That's when you want to think about who your other friends in the community are. And I would finally add to that, reach out to libraries that have made the news where protests have happened, get their advice, listen to how they handled the situation, or even afterwards, maybe some of the things to avoid or to say, okay, if I am going to reach out to law enforcement, these were some of the things that we encountered and some of the issues. So remember, like, that network is huge and building and librarians really do like to stick together and help each other out. and report it to ALA and and this panel, we need to know this, we need to have accurate information about what's going on boots on the ground. Well, one of the other questions that's come up both in the chat and something we were thinking of talking about specifically is um, we've talked a lot about challenges and the way that they work and the way that we're kind of contending with them currently, um, but one thing that always strikes me is that there's something very specific about comics and graphic novels being challenged because they're different from prose. Um, they're, the visuals often make it at least easier in some ways for people to pull out something that they find upsetting or offensive. Um, so I wondered if you could all talk a little bit about the fact that it's comics, the fact that it's graphic novels, what does that change about how you might deal with challengers or what doesn't it change? Um, and uh, I know someone mentioned the idea, is, is there an issue with the fact that we're calling them graphic novels as in graphic? Um, I know that's a longstanding thing uh, that comes up every time I have to talk about that term. Um, we did joke before this panel that I've been doing this since 2002 and I didn't think we'd all still be having all these discussions or have it even be worse now. Um, but I think that that's a real key for dealing with comics and graphic novels specifically is how do you deal with the format in terms of addressing the challenges? I can start and just say, I didn't expect when I went back to school that I would be studying historical comic censorship. <laughs> um, I had done, you know, similar sort of to some of the work Robin was doing for not as long, but working with schools and libraries with comics. And it seemed that we kept doing the same presentation over and over again. We kept kind of dead ending with a certain amount of our audience where they're like, eh, but comics, ugh, I don't know. And that was where I started to kind of poke at stuff in terms of the historical legacy. And I think something that we're fighting against, whether or not we realize that, is that 
for decades, people believed that comic books were detrimental to especially child health, that comic books could lead to juvenile delinquency and lead to poor reading. And I think that thread continues in more ways than we realize. Um, a lot of the people who were sitting on these community committees I mentioned, they were people who were lecturers in education, lecturers in library science, um, lecturers in child psychology. So we have decades of people vocationally who've also grown up with ideas around certain formats, that certain formats maybe aren't quite, you know, helpful to developing reading skills. And we see this, whether it's a bookstore or certain curriculum in which comics are still described as gateways to reading or stepping stones to reading or for reluctant readers. Um, and so I think that creates a foundation in which this is very easy for a lot of these challenges to pop up because within most school and library settings, we still don't have that widespread advocacy vocationally for comics as a format. I think the other thing, um, I'll just very briefly speak to the graphic novel thing. What people are overlooking is that graphic novel itself is a market invention. I mean, it was a way for the industry to rebrand the format that they loved in a way that was a little bit more palatable to an audience that didn't really want to receive comics. Um, in Canada, it was actually a very strategic thing because comics were still in the criminal code in terms of obscenity. So calling something a graphic novel did make it seem a little bit more illustrious. That being said, yeah, even the term graphic, people still overlook. So you have some people who think that they're sort of a higher form of comics, and yet some people still think that all graphic novels are for kids. And so we do see shelving issues still with all of the graphic novels um, for all ages put together. And these are, again, situation in which it lends itself so much more readily to challenges to pop up. I can share a couple of examples from the school library that I work at too. Um, a couple of really great graphic novels. Anya's Ghost by Vera Brosgol. Um, great story. Love that book to death. There is a reference to um, menstruation in the book that I may not want for the K2 kids, but for my fourth and fifth graders, that's fine. Um, so I do think you have to be thoughtful sometimes about who the audience is if you are in a school library. Um, sometimes that can get taken a little far though, like Drama by Raina Telgemeier gets challenged all the time. Um, Aquacorn Cove has also come up on a couple of lists because there's a friendship that some people perceive as being something it isn't. Well, it may well be, um, I like that book too, but it's just thinking about the audiences, um, knowing your community, and if you are getting questions, just being able to explain them. Everyone else is good? Okay. Um, so one of the other questions that's come up is, is this is something I think I've certainly dealt with as a teen librarian is that a lot of challenges are specifically about it being inappropriate for the age. Um, and again, that comes up when it's comics because people see illustrations that they somehow deem inappropriate. Um, so there was also a question from someone, how do you deal with something being charged as, you know, pornographic or inappropriate? And there are a lot of people that consider things like moving from a, to a higher level collection. So using moving from children's to young adult or young adult to adult. And like, how do you do that? Or how should you not do that in terms of how slippery a slope does that become if you start doing it? So if anyone has any thoughts on that question. I will say since um, I work in the public library, I do see oftentimes um, moving up a book outside of the age group where it really does belong as a form of soft censorship that does occur quite frequently within our, our librarianship. Um, I think that there's certain times that you really have to dig down and bring out those reviews, um, bring out the, the interest. Um, one of my favorite examples is uh, hockey number one. Um, I'm going to say that backwards, but um, it's always, always very popular in our teen scene. 
but um, you get the Raina Telgemeier kids um, in our teen scene also looking into it. It looks very similar, but then mom and dad start seeing the very hockey specific accurate um, language. Um, and what's, what's always interesting when I have the conversation with parents who come in very upset um, is I get them to, to say, isn't it wonderful that you're coming in and talking with me? I think you have to thank the parents for showing an interest. And oftentimes that throws them off a little. Um, and you, you, you acknowledge them that they are trying to raise their child how they want to be raised. Um, but the wonderful thing about a library is there's a book for everyone. Um, and really emphasizing um, that there is a book for someone. So if, if there's something that they're looking for for their child, let me show you um, other books like Raina Telgemeier that would be appropriate. And always, always, always talking to the child and not the parent when possible. Um, and trying to transition that to making sure you're meeting the, the, the teen's needs. I think just um, building on Julia's point, I think one of the things to point out too with OIF's most recent uh, banned and challenged list is that most of the challenge requests are not coming from youth readers. Um, they are generally maybe not even coming from somebody who's read the book. So again, when you have a challenge policy, number one, have you read the book? Number two, exactly why? Um, but we've talked a lot about community advocacy. I think one of the biggest things too is our youth readers are some of the biggest advocates. I think in these unfortunate times, one of the best things has been so many, like whether it's a teen advisory group or whether it's just a group of kids coming together and pushing back and being like, no, we actually have a freedom to read. And this is what we wanna read. This is what we think is appropriate. And actually hearing from the kids themselves. Um, also building on what Julia said is, I do think that, <laughs> there is a fine line and it is a line hard for sometimes people to parse out between personal preferences and actually serving the needs of all of your communities. Whether it's a public library, an academic library, you have multiple readers that you're serving. And so if people find one thing personally offensive, that doesn't mean that they get to decide for other people. <laughs> um, I would also say, if you don't have a lawyer on staff at your library, make sure your library has some kind of legal advocate or advocates that you can reach out to, whether it's something like CBLDF, ACLU, and honestly, just get familiar a little bit with the law. <laughs> because one of the things I think people get us on fear, somebody comes and has a challenge and people are like, oh my goodness, this person has a problem, I should pull this off the shelf. It's actually not even the way the obscenity clause works in terms of the law. The law demands that you have, a book has to violate what they call community standard for something to be deemed obscene. So when you have a book that has a range of positive reviews from many different sources and the reviews say this book is appropriate for this particular age group, you have a consensus of at least vocational community support that this book is age appropriate. And then if you've already built up that advocacy in terms of parent groups and youth groups, you have enough of a pushback to be like, hey, I appreciate that you don't think this is appropriate for your child. However, this doesn't fulfill what we would deem to be something that would even fall under community standard. Uh, one book I wanted to point out that has fallen under scrutiny for this is Sex is a Funny Word, which is a fantastic book. It is a nonfiction comic book um, all about sex, consent, gender, identity for kids uh, ages six to 12. Um, and it is written by uh, Corey Silverberg is a child psychologist also Apparently the child of a children's librarian. <laughs> so this is a book that is extremely well reviewed and it's a book that has also been banned and challenged in very large number in both the US and Canada. Corey Silverberg is Canadian. So I think you're always gonna have that push and pull but it helps to know this book, for example, won a children's literature award for nonfiction in Canada. It was either 2015 or 2016. So to know those things about the titles that may be commonly you know, those hot button titles to know, actually, this book is very well reviewed. Actually, this book won this award, or this is where this book has been placed in terms of age appropriateness. And we actually haven't mentioned, which should be mentioned, 
the Library Bill of Rights and the right to read statements are essential when you're trying to unpack for parents specifically why um, you are focused not on them when you're talking about teen books, but their teen. Someone said, could you elaborate a little bit more about um, talking to the teen? We're here to serve every individual. And when you're talking to the parents, you have to understand that, yes, you have a right as a parent to when they bring home the books or however you govern, but once they hit the library, they have a freedom to check out anything in the collection. And that's a, a hard fight, but one that you have to fight with. And that's why I always recommend when you have a challenge and they bring their child in with them, try to transition the conversation to the child and try to meet what the child's needs are. Um, because that child is your, is just as a right to be there and get the books out that the parent does. And parents are not gonna like to hear that, but that's why we introduced the Bill of Rights, the freedom to read statements to them to let them realize that, you know, what if the books that you want to read, we took off because another parent said they didn't like those. Um, I, I always hate that old chestness. If everyone took out a book that they didn't like, there'd be nothing on the shelves. But I think that you do have to emphasize with them that we are here to serve the entire population. And um, you have a right to govern what your child does. But if they come in alone and they check out a book that you're not into, that's your job to govern that. We govern their freedom to check out whatever they'd like. Yeah, and always it's critical that there's whole library buy-in into those ideals and to make sure that the entire library from administration to frontline workers who may not even be there full-time on a regular basis, understand that and understand that process. Like sometimes you're gonna have to take a step back because these are emotionally charged issues, especially when parents are concerned about their child. And, you know, like to Julia's point, we can thank them because they're involved in their child's reading and that's incredibly important. But we can also take that step back and say, this is our library's policy, this is the policy of national international library organizations and you know always keep that foot forward whenever we're faced with challenges and go outside your library not just your staff your stakeholders and your trustees or whoever is your governing body you need to educate them constantly that this is your mission as a librarian getting books in people's hands the right book the right child And just to shift topics a little bit, but we've had a couple questions. One was someone who was asking about academic libraries um, and the, the, the role that they could play in the sense that they often don't get the volume of challenges that school and public libraries do, or at least younger grade schools. Um, and if there's a way they could somehow offer support or do, you know, offer a different role to help the community still have comics. Um, but of course, they also get faced a different problem in that comics aren't considered academic enough for academic collections. Um, but on top of that, someone also asked about um, adult uh, challenges to adult graphic novels, so challenges that are in adult collections. Um, I've seen some of those in my own work, so I know that does happen. Um, so does anyone have anything to add for either from the academic side or from the adult collections of graphic novels as more and more public libraries have them? Um, yeah, I'm actually working in an academic library now, and we just started our graphic novels collection um, within the last year. Yes, yeah, thank you, Julia. I'm really excited to get that work done. But one of the key one of the key things to consider is with soft censorship, and Julia brought this up. ILL is an important resource for getting the book into a patron's hand. So if we can build those collections and offer through ILL networks the kinds of things that maybe being pulled from shelves. Um, you know, just recently with Pride Month, there was Hide the Pride. So a lot of stuff is getting checked out, never returned. It might be difficult for the libraries to replace those items. But if we have them in an academic library, then we can offer those opportunities to lend that out to other people. Um, the second most important thing is that we're educating 
our faculty, our staff, and what graphic novels are. Um, I've started outreach within the different departments, and I do get a lot of blank stares when I say graphic novels, but the great thing is that we can start talking to them. So you're your education department, reach out to them, let them know, hey, these are some of the resources that we have avail available. These are some of the issues that come up with graphic novels. Um, let's educate them. Let's discuss it with them because as they go out into teaching and leading other groups, they're going to run into the same kinds of issues that we are now. So at least we can start to prepare them moving forward. Um, and so I do, I do worry because we do now in Florida have surveys to judge the political leanings of staff and faculty in universities. And while we may not be facing many challenges from the academic library side, I do feel that we might be the next battleground uh, moving forward, particularly in places like Florida and in Texas. So again, look at your collection development policy. If you don't have one in place, start preparing for that now because there may be uh, something down the road, and you might be facing more challenges moving forward. I was just going to say, I think one of the best partnerships is also academic libraries can help school and public libraries for the advocacy piece. Um, There's a question in the chat about different reading studies. There's a lot right now. Uh, one of the works I will just call out is Nick Susanis's Unflattening. So Nick Susanis, this is his PhD in education uh, from Columbia Teachers College in New York, and it is written as a comic book. And it is all about the benefits of visual learning. And there's a huge body of literature um, specifically on using unflattening, but on the benefits of visual learning, specifically um, teaching to critical inquiry skills and building that critical development around visual literacy for students, especially in grades um, six to 12. And so I think this is a natural fit for a lot of collaborative efforts. Um, all I know about graphic novels and comics, I also learned and benefited from my colleagues when I worked at the New York Public Library and also our partnership with the Office of Library Services and the Office of Social Studies because we all use things in a slightly different way and we saw students benefiting differently and being in collaboration with each other, especially with our academic colleagues, it was just creating more networks for discussion and we all benefited as a result. All right, I think we don't have that much time left. This has gone by extremely fast. I think we could all talk about this for probably a whole day. Um, but uh, one thing I thought I'd give you all one last chance. Uh, we did have the kind of one thing that you would wanna say to schools, libraries, staff, uh, students about how to deal with bans and challenges. Um, and then I do also wanna remind everyone that there are many great questions that have come in and we will be able, I believe, to answer them after the webinar. I know we'll get to see them afterwards and be able to chime in with answers. So uh, so, is, so, what's one thing you would want to share, one final thought about how to deal with these kinds of challenges? Policy, policy, policy. Um, know what yours is. If you don't have one, get one. Look at the best, uh, best practices out there and be prepared. Uh, remember, you are not alone. Uh, there's a community and a network behind you. Look for resources, look for allies. They are out there and they will help. And if you're a little library like we are, all of us in New Hampshire, <laughs> um, look to the big guys, Texas and Florida. If they're having it now, it's going to trickle down to the rest of us. So be prepared. Check out our toolkit. Um, I think echoing everything that um, this wonderful committee has said, and thank you, Robin, too. If you all don't know, Robin is our incoming president-elect for the Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable. Um, and I also believe there's more of us who love what we're doing and love this format, but maybe then there aren't. Um, one of the best things I did in New York was definitely working to get March by John Lewis, Nate Powell, and Andrew Iden into the public libraries collection and with the school curriculum. And that was one of the best things to see how many people were excited versus people who were dismissive. And 
I think, you know, if a former, you know, U.S. congressman can write his biography as a graphic novel, like there's these great opportunities that we might not even be aware of and advocates that are already there that maybe we just need to make contact with. So you're not alone. Be prepared. Get out there. Talk about what you love. And I did quickly want to chime in that everyone, just to make sure everyone understands that all this work is ongoing. Uh, this committee is still going. I'm, I presume it will be active as long as we need it. Um, so I think we'll be doing all sorts of research. Definitely fill out the survey if you haven't already. Um, and we need, as, as I believe Julia said, we need all the information we can get about what's actually happening. And I think that will be incredibly useful to make sure that all the tools that we can provide and all the support that we can provide is actually useful to everyone. Um, even just going through the Q&A here, I can see all sorts of things that are important to know. Um, and I think you know, sharing that widely is really important so that we can start to build a network that combats the other side. Um, but does anyone have any final thoughts they'd like to share? Anything else? I can always throw in another question if we want. I just want to say we have a bunch of toolkit resources available now on the website. So if you click on the link, um, it has the checklist that we um, reference. It also has um, some resources to best practices. It does have links in there. The ALA has a repository of some collection development policies and reconsideration and challenge policies to look at. So if people are looking for examples, we have a lot of um, additional resources available online with more to come. One little detail, I think um, the the resource that Amy you were discussing is called unflattening. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. that is Nick 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 Susanas um, unflattening, and I can just uh, there we are. And yeah, so <laughs> if you do just do a quick Google, and um, there's a lot of resources, and he has actually made a lot of his resources available online. The other one I'd point out is Jean Yang, especially when Jean Yang was National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, developed a whole suite of resources called Reading Without Walls, especially around reading comic books and graphic novels and all of the opportunities, um, educational opportunities that go along with that. And Julia, I just wanted to double check the hockey title that you were talking about. Was that check, please? Yes, check, okay. please, hockey number <laughs> one. I always get that backwards. Okay. I know exactly what you mean though. It looks one way and then you realize, oh no, this is college, so. But hey, I had dyslexia and graphic novels helped me. So that's why we have to keep fighting for them. And I would just add as a final piece, take care of yourselves, take care of your staff, your coworkers. You know, the, like I said before, these are really emotionally charged and, sometimes very personal attacks on individuals. So just make sure that you're giving people time off if they're feeling overwhelmed or stressed and that you're also preparing to, to let them know that they have support, that they're not alone, that you know they, they have a chance to kind of heal and breathe after these issues come up. Hi, everyone. This is Grace from Bookless. Um, I think that is all the time we have uh, for today, but I want to extend a huge, huge thank you to Amy, Julia, Gabriel, Ryan, and of course, Robin. This discussion was incredibly helpful and insightful, and we're so appreciative of your time and expertise. Just, I learned a ton and I, I just loved it. Um, I know we have a lot of questions we did not get to in the Q&A. As Robin mentioned, we will be forwarding these questions to our panelists. So um, just give them a couple of days to kind of uh, rest after this. And I do know that there's a lot of Comic-Con things happening. So, um, but our panelists can reach out via email um, after the webinar. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's video recording, slide presentation, the graphic novel comics and roundtable toolkit and survey that were mentioned today, 
and a certificate of completion. For more about Bookless webinars, be sure to visit www.booklessonline.com slash webinars. And I will say that we'll also include a link to the ALA Office of Intellectual Freedom site tomorrow in our follow-up e-blast so that all of you who are facing challenges can also get some support and resources there. And don't forget that July is Read Graphic Month here at Booklist, and this year we're going bigger than ever. Check out the Booklist blog to enter our sweepstakes, register for our graphic novel webinars, listen to the Read Graphic playlist on our YouTube channel, and of course, read this year's Guide to Graphic Novels, which is on the screen there. It's currently free, open to all, has tons of really smart uh, articles and really great um, pieces, and it focuses on all things manga. And with that, that concludes today's webinar. Thank you all so much again for being here. See you next time.